Thank you, Susanna. Um, no introduction, I'm going to go straight into it. Um, the foundation of our disease information that we give out um, to you and to, to farmers are these three guides, and I think these are all in your packs. We've got the Wheat Disease Management Guide, the Barley Disease Management Guide, and the Oilseed Rape Guide, which contains um, disease management information. And we re reprint these every two or three years as required as new information becomes available um, and just to update them. Every year we produce a fungicide activity and performance in wheat, barley and oilseed rape. They come out new every year, containing new information from our fungicide performance work. The oilseed rape one tends to come out first um, because obviously that's um, the crop that's treated first in the new year. So our fungicide performance research. The most important thing about this is it's independent. We're not selling anything. We're not selling chemicals. Um, so we're not pushing any particular product ahead of another. And because of that, it's popular with levy payers. It's our second biggest spend, actually, after the recommended list. We spend a little under £400,000 a year on our fungicide performance and work. So it's a big investment for us. And we've recently procured the next five years of this project, so we've got long-term interest in this work. We trial the leading products side by side. Um, we tend to focus on the new chemistry coming through. Unfortunately, the agrochemical companies keep producing new chemistry in terms of fungicides. So we can, you can see those trials side by side um, in fair conditions. Most of the ag big ag companies are quite cooperative with us in a way in that they allow us to have products um, on their development stream before they come to registration. So we'll have products in, um, in trial before they're registered. So in most cases, um, we'll get immediate new information on products when they become registered. And often we'll have two or three years data available when they're registered. So it's a robust um, data set. Isn't always the case. Some of the ag chems are a little bit cagey about some of their products. But often we'll have two or three years information um, available when a, project, uh, a new product comes to registration. We have a standard format. It's been the same for years. Um, hopefully it's easy to understand. I'll go through a little bit about how to interpret uh, our data, um, but it should be fairly easy to understand. And we now have a, a, a fairly unique long-term data set for fungicide performance, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. As I've already said, it's independent um, from the industry and from distributors. We're not trying to sell anything. And it's overseen by the Fungicide Working Group. Fungicide Working Group involves people from ADAS, NIAB, uh, Scotland's Rural College, former Scottish Agricultural College, Arthur Adam Chuggas, which is the Irish um, Agricultural Research um, Institute, and Rothamsted Research. And they sit on the Fungicide Working Group, along with myself um, and a couple of other people from HGCA. We oversee all this work. We select products based on um, these people's expert knowledge, um, but we're guided by ground rules. These are a set of uh, rules which say what, how we prioritise what the products go into trial. So obviously there's an awful lot of products out there we could test. Um, so we have a series of ground rules which decides what we're going to test. Trials are run by AIDAS, NIAB, SIUC, uh, Scottish Agronomy, um, Chuggas, fund their own trials, but they use our protocols. So we swap information between the two groups. All the data comes back to HGCA um, for analysis. There's no jiggery-pokery going on um, with people analysing their own data. Um, and then knowledge transfer is done a uh, mixture of um, HGCA and also the project partners um, here. So what are we actually testing? Um, Wheat is our oldest series of trials, started back in 1994, so we've got data going back a long time now. We focus on septoria, um, so that's the biggest disease in wheat. We've got five trials, two um, trials with a T1 spray, two with a T2 spray, and then Chuggas have their own trial, which is a T2 trial. We also have a, a yellow rust trial, um, a brown rust trial, and from harvest 2015, we're going to have a head blight trial. That's the disease that's become more... Um, important in recent years because of um, mycotoxin issues. Barley started in 2002, two Rinko trials, there's a Chuggas trial over in Ireland, two net blot trials, a mildew around the area. We did used to have a brown rust trial in barley, we could never get any disease. Ironically, this year, 
Harvest 2014 was the last year we've had a Bramless trial and we've got loads of data. Um, Oilseed Rape is the most recent, 2006. Um, it started as just a research project, but it's morphed into um, fungicide performance. Two light leaf spot trials, but from next year, Harvest 2015, we're going to have three, because light leaf spot seems to be becoming more and more of an issue. Chuggas also run a light leaf spot trial. Um, we've got two FOMA trials and two sclerotinia trials. And when I say these are, these are diseases, the reason we, or we tar or how we target these diseases is we put trials in areas where we expect particular diseases to be um, very uh, prevalent. So our, our wheat yellow rust trial goes on, on near the wash. Um, we've got a rhynchosporium trial in West Wales. We put the, the varieties, and we use varieties that are susceptible to those particular diseases. It doesn't always work. Sometimes we get lots of diseases, but most of the time we have um, one disease dominating. Our trials are your classic replicated, three times replicated uh, plot trials. You'll have seen them no end of times. For our cereals, we apply fungicides just once. This is not about um, programs. This is just about testing how well one product performs next to another. You, t you can take the information away then, and then you build the programs. We're not testing programs. We apply quarter dose, half dose, a full label dose, and twice the full label rate. Why do we do it like that? Obviously, a, a that is illegal. It's purely for dose fit, for curve fitting, for purely for statistical purposes. Some people sometimes say, well, you should be, have all your doses of sort of half, three quarters. That's where people actually, um, what they spray. Well, it may be, but we can't fit a proper curve um, if we put all our doses around three quarters to full. As I've already said, we apply either a, a T1 spray, a, a gross dose 31, 32, or T2 except for ramularia, because um, that's a late season disease in barley, so we're on a growth stage 45 to 49 there. The all-seed rape trials are slightly different. Um, they're a little closer to commercial practice, so we have uh, uh, two sprays there for foam and light leaf spot, one for sclerotinia. We have a slightly different dose profile for all-seed rape. We're going at a quarter, a half, three quarters, and a full label. Um, the reason we don't go any higher, even though it would, in theory, help us plot the curve more accurately, is because the PGR effect of some of our products, uh, tebaconazole, metconazole products, even at full dose, we sometimes see uh, yield depression from those products, so we can't go any higher on the oil seed rate. Foam and light leaf spot, um, we'll get a spray of, um, against sclerotinia if there's, a, if there's a threat that year. So in terms of output, well, if you come to the agronomist conference in December, and I would encourage you to do that, that's where we've released the New Year's um, serial um, data. And this is what it'll look like. You won't see this anywhere else except at the um, Agronomist Conference. I'll explain why in a little bit. So this is what we get out of our trials. We get dose-response curves. Um, they're quite easy to interpret in, in some respects. So you've got disease up um, this axis, in this case, septoria, and you've got dose along here is this percentage percent of full label rate. So here's your full label, here's your double label. The points indicate our treatments, so full label, half, a quarter, um, and double out there. And the curves are statistically fitted curves onto those data points. Um, a few points to say about them. Um, one thing that people often say to us is, well, are these curves really different? If we look at this curve here, which is our SDHI uh, mixtures, okay, the ADEXAR curve looks a little bit lower than the um, aviator and the vertisan. Is that really different? What about statistics? Are they really significantly different? Well, we could put statistics on these. It's, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. We could say which lines are statistically different. There are different ways of doing it. We could give you a number that talks about the curvature of the line. We could pick individual points and say, this point is statistically different from this one. We don't do that, and um, it's something that comes up and we reviewed it again last year. Um, if we start putting error bars on and giving you numbers of, about curvature, it starts to get complicated. The benefit of these sort of curves is they're relatively simple. And I could say, we could fit some statistics and say, okay, this point is statistically different to that point. Great, but it's less than 1% difference in terms of disease. Is that really important in, in the field? That's what you need to decide. So actually, are these differences really important? These differences, yes. Clearly, they are important. Um, 
but it's more for you to interpret those differences. Another thing you can look at in these curves, and this is, this is why you should come to the agronomist conference, is we, we put points, um, the actual data points on the curves when we share them at the agronomist conference and at the agronomy workshops. And that's quite helpful to interpret the curves as well. If we look here at the vertisan, the um, orangey and the inflex, the blue line, are these lines really different? Well, they're quite close together, but if you look at the actual individual data points, the vertisan is always higher, there's always more disease at every disease, le at every treatment level in the vertisan. So that's an indication that, that those curves probably are actually different. In other cases, if we look at the, the blue line, the brown line, pro line and ignite, the order of the points swaps around a bit. Sometimes the ignite's above the um, pro line, sometimes the pro line's above the ignite. That's probably telling you, even though the curves look a bit different, they're probably not that different. If you, the other thing to look at is spread of points around curves. It's quite interesting that when you get a product that works really well, such as the SDHIAs or mixtures, points tend to fit the curves quite nicely. In products that are weaker, such as the Phoenix here, the spread of the points around the lines tends to be more. They tend to scatter around the lines more. So that's another thing to look at when you're looking at these curves. Um, we show up to double dose. Um, if you come to the Economist Conference, there are platform presentations like this. What we do then is when we put them in the, in, in the hard copy publications or on our website, we get rid of the points or we, or we just clean them all up um, and we reduce it down to just up to full label. We don't want to encourage people to start using um, more than full label. So the most complete data set you're going to get is on a platform presentation like this. Um, if you just go for hard copy, you get a slightly um, cut down version of what's available. Um, another output from our fungicide performance worker, it's, it's a mixture of fungicide performance worker, it's a mixture of our fungicide working group expertise with our so-called star charts. Um, I hate these. Um, because they're the agrochemical companies don't like them, and so I get grief from them every year. Um, what it shows is it's a, a relatively crude activity rating of, of against different diseases, in this case it's wheat again. Um, and we're not talking about products here, we're talking about um, chemicals, <coughs> active ingredients. So uh, uh, more stars that you have, the, better, the more activity you have against that disease. Um, so five stars, uh, flux peroxide and epoxyconazole, adexar, it works really get well against dipsoria. Um, Caprodinil, no, against mildew. So that's how it works. Um, the dashes don't, don't mean it doesn't work, it means we haven't got information, either we ha or we haven't got enough information to be confident about a star rating. As I say, they're, they're fairly crude um, compared to the curves, but they're quite useful if you're in a situation where you face a disease which you, isn't very common. If you're working in the southwest and suddenly you find you're getting a lot of yellow rust coming in, it's an odd season. Um, this is a, a quick check to find out if the products that you're using are going to be effective against those odd diseases. The other thing we um, is in those sheets is um, seed treatment information. This is mostly off the label. We don't do any trials on seed treatments. This is pretty much the label. Um, but there's also um, some information, some expert opinion on some of these seed treatments as well. New, possibly, for 2014. This may be at the Agronomist Conference. Um, it may not. It's, it's a new trial series that we've been running for four years now. It's just a single trial. Um, but it's looking at a, a broader picture of fungicide performance. So rather than just a single spray timing, it uses multiple sp the trial uses multiple spray timings and multiple dose rates. It's a much bigger, much more complicated trial. We can use it to produce our traditional um, fungicide performance <coughs> curves, which I've already shown you. Um, but the reason we're doing it is to try and look at the width of the spray window. That is, how far can you get away from your optimum timing of spray um, and still get good performance? And this shows um, data for Segiris from um, 2011 to 2013. It works the opposite way around. So we're talking about percent control here. So 100% control up here and very poor control here. And on the bottom, we've got days either side of our optimum spray window. So what you can see here is as you move away from your optimum spray window, either you're spraying earlier or you're spraying later, performance falls off from 100%. 
The idea of this is that the shape of the curve shows you how flexible your spray window is. If we put chlorothalonil on here, it would, it would be pretty much straight up and down because you, as soon as you miss that spray window with chlorothalonil, you lose um, activity. If you put a Dexar on here, a Dexar would look flatter because you've got more of a spray window with a Dexar. It's a little bit more robust. Um, we're hoping to have this all, all this analyzed for um, a 2014 agronomist conference. But the statistics behind this is quite a lot more complicated. So it's proving more of an issue to do the statistics than it is to do the trials. Uh, whether we continue with this trial design beyond this year is a little bit open to question because of that, that difficulty in getting the data analyzed quickly. In terms of oil seed rape output, um, it's quite we handle the oil seed rape output quite differently. Um, as I say, it's more of a, more of a research project. What we try and do with that is produce an annual report as quickly as possible after the data is produced in order to make it useful for the immediate year's spraying. So we aim to get it out in the first week in October. We'd like to get it out a bit earlier than that. Um, the, the light leaf's got on the FOMA. Um, it's giving you more, more warning. But realistically, that's as fast as we can turn the data around and get it checked and make sure we're not saying anything that agrochemical companies are going to throw their arms up and say, no, that's rubbish, you can't say that about our product. Um, so we aim for the first week of October. Ferritinia, we aim for spring, because um, obviously that's um, not such an urgent, urgent thing. As I said, it's more, in the past it has been more of a traditional sort of research project. Um, and so we produce more of a traditional research output. So this is, our, this is light leaf spot performance, uh, disease level. We've got our, our, our different products here, uh, half and full label rate at disease level, and then we've got yields up here. So it's more for a traditional output. We can put LSDs on this, the uh, least significant difference. Um, and that's worked quite well up until now. Um, but there are disadvantages of not having a, a dose response curve. So we're moving towards the wheat and barley model with fewer products tested with four dose levels so we can produce dose response curves. Um, and in future, you'll, you won't see this anymore. You will see the dose response curves for the oilseed rape as well. So that's our fungicide performance work. Um, fungicide resistance is a big issue, becoming more so for a number of different reasons. There's a lot of pressure on fungicides um, out there in the field now. EU legislation is cutting down a number of actives all the time. Water framework directive, endocrine disruption, hazard criteria. All of these are cutting down the number of actives we have as to use as fungicides. We've got growing resistance of at least some of our pathogens, septoria, light leaf spot, rinko, ramularia, mildew, they're all showing resistance to some, um, at least um, in case of some, a lot of our fungicides. We've got fewer act actives arriving on the market and the rate of those new actives arising is slowing down. Now it takes around nine years and around 250 million euros to get a new product to market. And as you can imagine, um, the agrochemical companies are only pushing product forward that they are really, really confident are going to work and are get, going to get to the registration process because you don't want to get 200 million euros in and so find out, oh, it doesn't really work or it's not going to get through toxicology tests. All that means is we've got fewer options to control disease. Fewer options to control disease means more selection pressure, means more resistance issues. So it's a big problem. What is HGCA doing about it? We're focusing on research. We've got four main areas. Um, monitoring shift in azole performance against septoria, that's a big issue, and I'm going to come back to that. SDHI stewardship. Um, SDHIs are really what we're relying on to control septoria and wheat now. If we lose those, we're going to be in big trouble. We're basically going to be controlling septoria with chlorothalonil and nothing else. So we're looking at what's the impact of dose, number of applications, and mixing partner on development of resistance to SDHIs. Looking at seed treatments, if you use a fungicidal seed treatment, is that pushing resistance even further? And we're looking at the impact of variety resistance on selection for resistance. So if you grow a variety with a, a resistance of, of eight, is that slow resistance development compared to a variety with four, or does that actually make no difference at all? We also sit on the Fungicide Resistance, resistance Action Group, which is a UK-based group of academics and um, industry, uh, ag chem industry, um, who sit together and talk about what are the issues in resistance, what are the latest things going on. 
So we can get information from there and feed that back through to you. So declining Azob forms, I'm talking here against Septoil. This has been recognised um, for quite a long time now, almost since the Azol started to be used. The degree and rate of it has been rather in dispute. Um, Fungicide performance now provides a long-term data set on that Azol performance. As I said, the wheat performance work goes back to 1994, and that's a fairly unique data set that's in effectively in the public domain. We're also doing research to look at changes um, in the CYP51 gene. That's the gene that produces the protein which Azols target. And this here, for anyone who's vaguely interested, is, um, is a model of the protein which Azols target. And you probably won't be able to see, um, but sitting in the middle there is, a, is an Azol. And we're getting to the stage now where we can model how an individual fungicide interacts with a protein. And in theory, in a few years' time, we might be able to predict how individual mutations will affect um, resistance to um, not just azoles, but to all fungicides. So that's a little way ahead now. And that's work that's going on, not funded by us, it's more, if you like, pure science work, but it's happening out there now. So I said the um, fungicide performance work provides a unique long-term data set now. Um, and this is the sort of thing we can do with it. So this is septoria control with epoxiconazole. Historical trends from 95 to 2013 in a protectant situation. I'm sure you all know what that means. Um, so we're looking at a percentage control here again. So if you go back to the um, late 90s, half label rate of epoxiconazole will give you 80 to 90 percent control of septoria. If we move forward now to 2013, we've dropped off to around 50 to 60 percent. We've seen this decline in performance of epoxiconazole against septoria. The decline hasn't been as steep in full label rate, and that means we can offer you a message now. If you're going to use Azoles against Septoria, you have to push the dose up. There's no point messing around with a half rate date, half rate dose, and certainly not a quarter. It's just not doing the job anymore. Similar situation with Papiaconazole, about al almost an identical slope. We've seen this fall off in protectant activity over sort of 15 years, um, and again, the fall off isn't so steep at a full rate as is a half rate. You must push those azole doses. And this is the sort of thing um, which we can show from fungicide forms. The ag chemists have this sort of information, but they're not so keen to release it um, as, as we're free to release it. The really scary graphs, or the really scary graphs, is th are these ones, which are eradicant or curative activity of, um, we've got opus, ignite, and proline on these curves. Um, the opus has been, is the with the blue dots and the, and the open triangles of the proline, we've had a massive fall off in eradicant activity of these leading azoles against septoria um, from around 80 to 90% back around 2000. Down, we're looking at 20 to 30% um, disease control now. That's the sort of information we can get from fungicide performance now, and there are other things we're, we're kind of tinkering around with. Um, this is quite a, a scary um, table. I'm I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is illustrative of what we're doing, um, looking at less sensitive septoria isolates. Um, it's relatively straightforward. What we have down here are different isolates. This is different individual um, septoria lesions which have been taken away, isolated and grown in the lab um, at different, different time periods. Here we've got um, epoxiconazole, uh, perchlora, tebiconazole, and prothioconazole. And all it's showing is the concentration of these fungicides we have to use to kill um, those septoria isolates. So if we go look here, this is our, what we call a wild type. This is an isolate before azoles were used. And you didn't need very much, very low concentrations of these fungicides to kill those isolates. If we move to the period 1994 to 2008, what this shows is mutations in that gene, that CYP51 gene. So we have an isolate here, just one mutation, then two, and three, and four, and I think five in that one. What we've seen as time has passed is, is Septoria starts to accumulate mutations. And what that has meant is that as those mutations have accumulated, we're having to use higher and higher concentrations of these fungicides to kill Septoria. And that process is continuing more and more and more. If we get down to here, we've got eight different mutations. If you look here at some of these for epoxiconazole, we're having to use a thousand times greater concentration to kill these isolates as we were to kill these. 
And that's the process that appears to be continuing. We're not only getting mutations, now we're getting changes in other, in, um, other parts of the metabolism of septoria, um, which is pushing that even further and further. People sometimes say, is this going to stop at some point? Is septoria going to stop its ability to keep any more resistance to azoles? All the information we have so far says there's no sign of that. So how do we slow what azole resistance? We've still got some useful protectant activity. How can we, we slow the development of resistance? The interesting thing is the UK has more pronounced decline in azole performance than the rest of Europe. That's because we use far more azoles than everyone else. We've got high disease pressure in the UK and we do, or UK and Ireland than we do on the continent. All our work now, uh, or our modeling work, um, shows that azole resistance is driven by the number of applications. More sprays, more exposure to pathogens to azole, so that means more selection. All this work we've done on looking at mutations, how they accumulate, all this is providing information that we can put into models to start to say, look at the difference between the number of applications and the dose. What we now know is that actually for azoles and septoria, dose actually has very little effect on, on developing resistance. So you can put as much azole on as you want, well, up to label recommendation, of course, um, and it's not going to drive resistance. It's the number of applications for azoles that drive um, resistance. What does that mean for practical um, field um, activity? Well, if you're using azoles that are T0 for rust control or T3 for ear blight, in addition to your core T1 and T2, you're driving resistance further and further. If you start going in, as like many people did this year, T1 and a half, so T4s with azoles, again, you're driving resistance harder and harder. What you should be really thinking about is trying to focus your azoles on these core timings and look, think about using other products um, at T0 for rust control. There's not much else you can do here. Um, but try and limit your number of azoles if you possibly can. What about SDHIs? And as I said, we're leaning very much on SDHIs for septoria control in wheat. And they're regarded as medium to high risk of development of resistance. They're not going to be like QOIs and go in a single year, um, but they're probably going to, if resist well, resistance is already starting to appear, it's probably going to go faster than it has done for azoles. Lab mutations have been created in septoria, and they show a high degree of cross resistance between different SDHIs. So it's likely that when field resistance does appear, it's going to affect several of them at once, not just a single one. Field mutations of net blotch have been identified in 2012 and 2013. Um, so far, they haven't impacted um, activity of SDHIs very much, but there has been a small shift. It will come, it's just a matter of when. Um, all the modeling work shows that both dose and number of applications of SDHIs will drive resistance. It's different to azoles. Um, so only use the minimum dose you need to control disease, um, and you're limited by legislation by to two dose to two applications. Tank mixing two SDHIs is not an anti-resistance strategy. Topping up your boss glib with a bit of Imprex is not an anti-resistance strategy. It will make the situation worse. And using solo SDHIs without a mixing partner is a suicidal strategy. We have to maintain activity of SDHIs against septoria, otherwise we're in big trouble. Because unfortunately, Simon's varieties aren't, haven't got a nine for, for septoria resistance yet, and maybe they never will. Some general principles. Um, Mix different modes of actions wherever you can. Um, pathogens find it very difficult to fight a battle on two fronts. Uh, they can't resist two, or find it very difficult to resist two different chemicals at once. And the same with alter alternating, that helps as well. If we're talking about wheat and septoria, multi-sites, chlorothalonil and folpet, reduce selection. Again, it's a case of they can't fight these and your azoles or your SDHIs at the same time. And actually, all our fungicide performance work now shows, and I think pretty much everyone's work shows now, that chlorothalonil now is more effective as a protectant than prothioconazole or epoxyconazole against septoria, because the activity of those has, has declined so much. Don't dismiss this, because it's old chemistry and it's relatively cheap. It does a good job in the right situation. As far as keeping up to date with um, fungicide resistance issues, 
Fungal Cell Resistance Action Group, already mentioned, it's UK based, um, chaired by Fiona Burnett, a pathologist at Scot uh, uh, Scotland's Rural College. That, this is the website, um, provides latest information on resistance issues in the UK. They produce annually um, this publication, this booklet, Fungal Cell Resistance Management in Serials. Um, HGCA pays for this to be printed. Uh, uh, FRAG has no money of themselves, it's a purely voluntary thing. So we pay for this to be published every year, and that has the latest um, resistance information for cereals. There's also um, a leaflet on fungicide resistance um, in oral cedarabe, and I haven't really mentioned oral cedarabe. I focus very much on septoria because that's the big issue. We are now starting to see issues with fungicide resistance in oral cedarabe. Um, if you go to Scotland, they'll talk about azole resistance in like leaf spot. We started, we've got a couple of projects on this started recently. We are starting to see resistance issues in in oral cedar rape. If you go to the, on the continent, they've got serious uh, resistance issues um, against sclerotinia. They've got phosphatidyl resistance in, in sclerotinia. Um, so we have to keep an eye on oral cedar rape as well. European Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. Now this is a purely ag chem industry body. Um, so they're not always as free with the information they have as, as they uh, can be. Um, but it's a very good uh, resource in terms of information about resistance. It has, has a very wide uh, remit, not just the cereals. It goes to everything from turf, uh, grass, um, to fruit, and everything from everything. So that's quite a good resource as well. Thank you.